So after three offensive messages from Ben, I thought it was time <laughs> to get defensive. If you're new here, by the way, uh, review some of the old messages online because I'm not trying to, you know. To review, as a kingdom at war, uh, we go on the offensive in a number of ways. We declare victory, choosing sides, and coming to the Lord through baptism. We go on the offensive with the word of God, sharper than any double-edged sword. And last week, our pastor pointedly preached on praise and proclamation. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Though the outcome of our battle has been settled... We win, as we just remembered with communion. We still find ourselves on the defensive. Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, 8, Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. There will come times when you are that someone. You are on the devil's dinner menu. When Satan strikes, will he find you a weak, vulnerable unprotected, delicate morsel, seasoned with lust and anger, marinated in fear and cowardice, or will his teeth be shattered by some divine hand-me-downs? Now, you may not associate hand-me-downs with being particularly strong. Perhaps your experience is like what goes on in my house, where by the time clothes or shoes get down to Evan, my youngest, they've been so stained and ripped and torn and pierced full of holes by Owen that they're practically useless and they have to start over. As a side note, it was at this point in sermon writing that I thought about making a comment about putting on holy clothing. Uh, but remembering the, the memory verse, I resisted. <laughs> Nevertheless, we are called to, our, to adorn ourselves with the one who has been stained, ripped, torn, and pierced full of holes. Romans 13, 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Galatians 3, 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And so to consider our defensive strategy this week as a kingdom at war, we're going to look at three things. First, we're going to look at our divine hand-me-downs. Secondly, we're going to ask the question of what exactly are we defending? And we shall conclude by returning to the book of Acts and pondering two case studies. Uh, the examples of Stephen and Paul, two men who put on the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might be able to imitate them as they imitated Christ. So let's pray as we get into it. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we give you praise for another wonderful day in which we can come together as a body of believers, that we have the opportunity to sing your praises, to remember your death, burial, and resurrection, that we have time to, to hear from your word and to hear it proclaimed and preached. Lord, we thank you so much that you have given us this, this wonderful opportunity uh, to honor you. Oh, Lord, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's start by talking about some divine hand-me-downs. And by this, I do not mean the fortuitous occasion when your brother's Nikes are still in good enough condition to become yours, uh, but the armor of God which the Lord has handed down to us. Paul concludes his letter to the church at Ephesus by telling them to dress up for church. Not with a fancy blazer and tie, otherwise Ben and I would both be disqualified. And not with a beautiful dress or your finest makeup, not with your Sunday best, but with the very armor God himself wears into battle. So go ahead, if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, we're going to focus on verses 10 through 17, but we're also going to be kind of all over a little bit. So we'll be seeing some acts as well. But go ahead. Ephesians 6, turn there, type there, get there somehow. Let's go ahead and start. Ephesians 6.10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Pause. Now, as we will not spend much time going into this verse, I thought it was worth highlighting the obvious. The obvious being, we are to be strong in who? The Lord. Now, I think that's so important to point out because that means if you're weak or if you feel weak, that's irrelevant. 
Because it's ultimately the Lord's strength that we're resting in. It's ultimately the Lord's strength that we're putting on. And so if you come here and you're like, oh, it's been such a terrible week, I don't know. It's fine. doesn't matter. Because it is the Lord's strength that we are putting on. Sometimes we just have to point out the painfully obvious uh, when it comes to the scriptures because we are so foolish and, and glaze over those things. So take comfort, Christian. The strength we carry, the strength we rest in, isn't our own. Let's continue. Verse 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Allow me to pause again. If you've been following along in our spiritual warfare series, this verse should be pretty familiar by now. But again, it bears repeating. Your enemy isn't your wife. Your enemy isn't your husband. Your enemy isn't your son, your daughter, your mom, your dad, your boss, your coworker, or even your government. It's the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Let's continue. Verse 13. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. When it comes to the full armor of God, each article has its origins in the Old Testament. Um, and specifically, in Old Testament descriptions of God himself. The bulk of which come from the book of Isaiah. A prophet of both hope and horror. Who speaks of the coming judgment and exile to come upon Judah. As well as the suffering servant, the Messiah who will come and ultimately heal the nations through his own wounds. Paul starts with the belt of truth in verse 14 of chapter 6, but we see this first reference in Isaiah 11.5, which says, Also, righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. Isaiah 11 looks ahead to a shoot of Jesse. Who's Jesse? David's father. Good job, pastor. Yes, David's father. <laughs> and ultimately, we see that one through the line of David who would have the spirit of the Lord upon him, this one will judge righteously, for he is adorned with a belt of truth. Now, like a belt, doesn't the truth just hold everything together? You know, if the Christian message is not true, 1 Corinthians says we are of all men the most to be pitied. When we think about the battleground, which is the heavenly places, and when we think about our enemy, Satan and his forces, it's of no surprise that perhaps the most common and powerful weapon in the enemy's arsenal is the perversion of truth. Consider, for instance, the beginning. We have Adam and Eve. When the serpent tempted them, it's not as though he came in and thought, okay, sin number one needs to be murder. No, he, he came in and thought, okay, the way I get to them is through twisting through deception, through lies. Genesis 3, 4 and 5. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so we see also during the temptation of Jesus, Satan takes the truth of God's word and twists it. If you are the Son of God, wouldn't the Father want to feed you, to protect you, to give you all the kingdoms of the world? I'm sure you've heard a similar voice at different times. If you were really saved, wouldn't you stop struggling with that sin by now? If God loves you, would he really let this happen to you? If you were a godly parent, surely your children would be more faithful. These are all lies that I'm sure you've heard. Jesus said that he is the way the truth, and the life. As we grow in our knowledge of Jesus, we grow in our knowledge of truth, and we grow in our defense against the adversary. Putting on Christ, putting on the armor of God, starts with loving truth. 
I recently asked a, youth, a group of youth, not our group of youth, by the way, if it's okay to tell someone they're wrong. It's, it's a tough question to ask youth these days. You know, ask, am I allowed to tell somebody that they're wrong? And, and in response, many of them were, were not only reluctant, but they suggested it is indeed wrong to tell someone they're wrong. Now, they, they missed uh, the contradictory irony of their position, but we see that cultures have hierarchies of sin. And in our twisted culture, there are few sins greater right now than just telling the truth. And so that's something that as believers, we need to be ready to, to speak up against. We are being trained and our youth are being conditioned to believe that seeking truth is wrong and hateful. Uh, in a popular and very controversial documentary, What is a Woman?, uh, Matt Walsh interviews a Ten Tennessee University gender studies professor named Patrick uh, Grzenka. And after Walsh says that he is simply trying to seek after the truth, Grzenka replies that the truth is transphobic, condescending, and rude. Now, he is not alone in his sentiments. If we are not involved in our children's education, if we are not supervising our kids' social media access through, through phones and other devices, then we are paying, paying to have our children trained to hate truth. I hope you recognize that. You, you, are, you are exchanging money for your children to hate truth. And so we need to repent where, where we have actively engaged in destroying the minds of those we love and cherish. Paul proceeds from the belt of truth to the breastplate of righteousness. Now that, that is a strong phrase, the breastplate of righteousness. We return again to Isaiah. Isaiah 59, 15 through 17 reads, Yes, truth is lacking, and he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. Now the Lord saw, and it was displeasing in his sight that there was no justice. And he saw that there was no man, and was astonished that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing, and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. So seeing no truth, seeing no justice... God's own arm brings salvation. If no one else will bring justice, God will. If since no one else can bring salvation, God will. Now, righteousness is one of those you know, loaded Christian terms that if you're kind of new to the church, you have no idea what it means. And so let me just simply say that it's a legal term that refers to being in right standing before God. So in the same way that uh, someone who is declared innocent by a judge uh, that person is made righteous in the eyes of that judge. They, they, are, they are right before the judge. And so our knowledge that God is just and is the one true judge in a world with many corrupt, corrupt judges is like a breastplate that protects us from potential death blows. Our sin has made each and every one of us, each and every one of us, guilty before God, and yet we can stand before him not not cowering in fear, but with confidence because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.21, and just hear the incredible absurdity of this statement. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's amazing. As often as the adversary reminds us of our sin, of our guilt, of our shame, we must be quick to respond with the truth, the truth that our debt has been paid, the truth that our sin, our guilt, and shame have been crucified with Christ. Christian, you are forgiven. Christian, you have been made new. In Iron Man the other week, Pete uh, played a really awesome video, or at least audio, because we weren't all fancy with the tech. So we had the audio, um, and he played this audio clip of Alistair Begg, and in it, Alistair Begg uh, was, was considering the, the scenario of what it must have looked like when the thief on the cross came to heaven and was being brought in by the angels. Um, and it was a pretty funny little interaction, 
But we, we saw that it, this thief didn't get into, hev- into heaven. He didn't get into eternity because of his understanding of the doctrine of justification. You know, he, he didn't get into heaven because he could better exegete the text. Um, he didn't get into heaven because he lived most of his life in the church. He didn't get into heaven because he was particularly obedient. He simply got into heaven because the man on the middle cross said he could. Jesus' righteousness is our defense because our righteousness is menstrual rags before God. Now, if that language offends you, take it up with the Lord. It's what he said in Isaiah 64, 6. You can check it out yourself. And so we continue with our divine hand-me-downs. Isaiah writes, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. In Isaiah 5, 7. Paul repeats this sentiment when he writes, Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of, of peace. The world takes beautiful things, like truth, and tries to make them ugly. But God ta- likes to take ugly things, like feet, and make them beautiful. The courts of the world crucified the only perfect man in history, and yet God, in his mercy, takes the news of Jesus' death on the cross and calls it good news. The world has made truth evil, but our Lord has used evil to bring about the good news of salvation. How can we not praise this God? Consider how Paul's words about a gospel of peace would serve both as an encouraging defense for those being persecuted by the Romans, the so-called empire of peace, and a mockery of the Roman Empire. Paul is effect- effectively telling those in Ephesus, uh, you know those officials going around uh, advocating peace or the sword? Well, uh, how's that working out? Uh, we don't follow Caesar. We follow a real king who brings real peace demonstrated by his willingness to die so that we might have peace with God. So think for a moment how our world can try to sell us peace and good news. It may come through excess, you know, just a little more of this, just a little more of that, and you'll be happy and, and at peace. It may come through money, you know, save enough money so that you can retire, and then after a lifetime of hard work, then, then, maybe, you can have peace. It may come through belonging. Uh, as group after group makes their pitch as to why you should identify with them, not others. Again, the truth of the gospel stands as our foundation, keeping us on solid ground when everything around us is falling apart. We put on the armor, but we take up the shield. Spoken of in the Psalms. Psalm 91.4 says, He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. The faith we take up is the day-to-day trust in God. Roman shields were pretty big. They were pretty large, about four feet by two feet. And they were designed to, to provide refuge not only for the one holding it, but for the person right next to them doing battle alongside them. Likewise, we should not think about a defensive strategy as something to be done alone in isolation. We do not advance alone, nor do we defend alone. Roman soldiers went into battle carrying wooden shields. Enemies would send flaming arrows into their ranks in order to break break up their defense. And so what is Paul's point then when he talks about being protected by these flaming arrows? Well, he's saying that there is no weapon strong enough to break down our shield. There is no weapon strong enough to, to, to really destroy our faith. Now we see that this is not about us. This is not about us having a a super strong faith, but yet again, it is about Jesus. It is about Christ, for it is by his faith that we have faith. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13. The full armor of God is about putting on Christ. He is our head. He is our authority. He is our master. He is our king. This brings us to the helmet of of salvation, which we've already seen in Isaiah 59, 16, and 17. Now, this kind of comes full circle because the helmet protects the mind. 
And it's in the mind where we hear and discern the very truths of the gospel we are called to proclaim and defend. When we are saved, we are saved from, but we're also saved for. We are saved from, and we're also saved for. We are saved from a multitude of things. We are saved from sin. We are saved from the punishment that we deserve. And oftentimes, you know, sometimes that's where Christians stop. You know, become a believer, get baptized, and be a part of the church. That's not the end. That's the beginning. Um, and so we see we are saved from sin for God, for having a real relationship with this creator who took on flesh that we may know him. For becoming a, we, we are saved for becoming a member of God's family. Interesting language. You know, salvation has become this really individualistic thing. However, if we look at scripture, salvation has always involved becoming a child of God. Well, child language is family language. And so being a child means belonging to a family. Adam and Eve were God's children. God's promise to Abraham was one of a family, one of innumerable descendants. The promise through the prophets was that a faithful remnant would endure as God's family. When Jesus came, he preached the kingdom, our opportunity to live like God's family now. And thus, when we think of salvation, we ought to think both of God's future deliver, deliver, deliverance and also of the present family of the church he has given us. And so when we think about salvation, that thought should not be disconnected from this. This is a very integral part of what it means to be saved. And when we're thinking about being a big family, Jenny March recently joked to me that even the dogs in this church are related. And if you don't know about that, ask me afterwards. There are a multitude of them. And so we are indeed a big family. I know I started here just back in January, and, and as I got to talking to people, suddenly it's like, oh, uh, there's like three families in this church. Uh, it's just really, you know, all just kind of connected. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity to meet with a lot of people throughout this past week, and I've heard about a lot of families. All families have skeletons, and all families have problems. All families struggle to show love and a, to show the love and affection that they truly have for one another. This church family, as warm as it is, is no different. You know, we've got problems. Uh, this side of eternity, we will never not have problems. But, and if you felt like a, a black sheep in this family, I pray you would forgive and forge on. You may feel like an appendix right now, but as Christ's body, we need you. After all, we've recently realized that the appendix makes valuable contributions to the body. Um, and, and so if, if that is where you've been feeling, my, my encouragement to you is to, is to think through, you know, how... Where can I get plugged in? How, how, what role do I play in this body? I may not be able to see it now, but, but there is a role. Finally, we take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. Now, Ben has tackled the, the offensive nature of the Word in recent weeks, but it's a double-edged sword. It defends as well. Jesus' defense in the desert was the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Now, Ben mentioned uh, in an illustration the other week this MMA fighter who would taunt his opponents by kind of letting his guard down. Now, he, he would put his hands behind his back and taunt his opponent. Now, I'm not sure if Ben and I are thinking about the same fighter, but when he said that, I immediately thought of Anderson Silva and the guy getting knocked out behind me. Um, and I remembered that, yeah, he did used to do that a lot until somebody got him. And so... What we see is, ultimately, you can do that. You can put your guard down, uh, but once an opponent lands one good shot, the fight is over. He was knocked out, and his arrogance was his downfall. Now, what's the point of this? The point is, if you are not regularly reading and memorizing Scripture, you are that fighter. That is you. Uh, you are setting yourself up to get knocked out. If, if your only time in the Word each week is right now, uh, then you need to change some things in your life today. 
Uh, you, you need to, to go home and rethink the, the priorities of your life. You need to rethink uh, how you spend your time. You need to rethink what time you get up in the morning. There are some things to change. It's not hard to change. You just need to make that decision and do that. Because it's only a matter of time until you get knocked out. Now, we've thought about the armor of God and, and how we are to take this up and how ultimately these are all things that God himself has passed down to us. Which brings us to the question of what exactly are we defending? Now, you may be surprised to learn that the armor is not necessarily for us. The armor may be on you, but it's not necessarily for you. Now, when we put on the armor, what then are we defending? What are we protecting? Let's think about four things. First, you are defending the hope that you have. When you put on the armor, you are defending the hope that you have. The armor speaks of truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, and salvation. And each of these things all equip us to give a defense for the hope that we have. We are not defending ourselves, but the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done. That is ultimately our defense. Are you prepared to give a defense for the hope that is in you? If not, again, I would encourage you to sit down and think through, why is it I have this hope? If I don't have this hope, what is in the way of that? These are some of the most important questions you can ever ask yourself. Ultimately, our testimonies exalt Christ's presence in our lives. I remember when I first started attending church, I did not grow up in the church, and I heard all of these words, these words ending with ism and ology and ation, you know, justification, sanctification, propitiation, salvation, and I was lost. Um, and, and I remember being absolutely overwhelmed thinking, I, <laughs> why become a Christian? Uh, I, I, am, I am never going to understand this stuff. Uh, these are rather large words. Um, and, and I was just overwhelmed. And so when we, sometimes we just overcomplicate things. And in, with this in mind, I absolutely love the testimony of the blind man in John. It is beautiful in its simplicity. John 9, 24 to 25. So a second time they, they being the Sanhedrin, the religious leadership of the day, they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man, referring to Jesus, is a sinner. The blind man then answered, <laughs> whether he's a sinner, I don't know. Uh, but one thing I do know, I was blind, now I see. That's it. That's his whole testimony. Yeah, I, I really don't know a lot about this guy. Uh, I didn't even see him. Uh, but I do know, <laughs> I do know, I was blind, now I see. Uh, that, that is it. You know, pastors can overcomplicate things. Amen? <laughs> One thing I do know. One thing I do know, before I knew Jesus, I was a suicidal, depressed porn addict. Now I'm not. I was blind. Now I see. And so when it comes to the hope that you have, don't overcomplicate things. Don't overcomplicate what Jesus has done for you. God is often glorified in the simple, in the mundane, by the dirty feet of those who bring good news. Secondly, you are defending the victory Christ has already accomplished. You are defending the victory Christ has already accomplished. Now, have you ever played a game that was over long before it was made final? Now, a couple of months ago, my family was on vacation, and my wife's laughing at me because she knows where this is going. And we were playing Risk 2210. Now, if you're unfamiliar, it's a futuristic risk in which one can conquer not just land, but also the seas and the moon. Territories are cut off from one another by nuclear wastelands. It's kind of like uh, what Fox News thinks might happen tomorrow. <laughs> and so, as one who grew up through the Northern Hills Christian Church Youth Group under Ben Walker, I've never actually read the rules to Risk 2210. Uh, I just know how he played it, and that's how I play it. Um, and so, ultimately, his mission is one not of territorial advancement, but of genocide. <laughs> Which sounds pretty awful when I put it that way, but I'm not wrong. That's exactly what it is. 
Um, and so the objective is to wipe one of the other opponents off the map. And so you kind of secretly distribute who your mission is. And I had the unenviable task of having to wipe out my wife. Now, not only is she really good at board games, but let's just say she's competitive. Uh, to, to the point that immediately I see my mission, and I'm like, you know, I'm just going to form strategies that achieve my destruction. You know, I'm going to lose. I don't care. It's not worth winning, because if I win, I lose. Uh, <laughs> because we're still on vacation. I don't want this to be terrible. But then, but then the worst thing happened. Everything, all the stars aligned. And uh, she was right there, ready for the pickets. And so I, I destroyed her. Uh, <laughs> and, and so there was a good 45 minutes where we all knew the outcome of the game. And everyone sat there in just quiet tension as Kristen's just, why are we finishing this game? And so it was tense. Uh, and we begrudgingly played it out to its final result. But the point is, for much of the game, I knew I had won, but I simply had to defend the victory I could already see on the horizon. When it comes to the faith, we're not simply defending a victory that's looming in the future, but a victory that's already been realized on the cross. There are still moves to be made, but the end is not in question. When Jesus died, he made proclamation of his victory to the seen and unseen realms alike. The result is final, but there are stu still a few rounds yet to be played. Thirdly, you are defending the church. You are defending the church. Years ago, I wrote a parable. It is not nearly on the, it is not scripture, but I thought it was pretty interesting. And so I, I thought I'd share it with regards to this. It goes like this. Three men, formerly princes but now peasants, wandered frantically throughout the woods, fleeing from their exile. In the distance, they could see a building being slowly swallowed up by the foliage. Upon reaching the dilapidated and dreary structure, one man tore his clothes, hopeless and paralyzed by grief. He disappeared back into the woods. A second man reached that broken building with a sense of ignorant and arrogant glee, seemingly blind to the obvious holes in the walls and the collapsing roof. He was content to watch the structure implode around him, blind to the obvious dangers. The third man gazed longingly at the building, weeping. And yet the tears in his eyes stirred him to action, for he knew the hope that such a body could provide and sought to repair and restore no matter the sacrifice. If you have ears to hear, then hear. The building is the church. Some see its problems and run away. Others ignore its problems and heap on more problems through their spiritual blindness. And yet some see the problems and commit to its defense, knowing it's not just a building, but a body. If you are part of a family long enough, that family is going to wound you. The church family is no different. And yet Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Paul writes, you are Christ's body and individually members of it. You wear the armor of God, not necessarily for yourself, but for your brothers and sisters in the faith. The church is not just described as a body, but as Christ's bride. Husbands, how do you feel? Excuse me, husbands, how do you feel? What goes through your heads when someone insults your wife? Uh, what would you do if someone attacked your wife? Do you shrug it off as no big deal? Do you join in? Do you just ignore it? Because many of us are guilty of abusing the bride of Christ. We see others tearing it down with malicious gossip, and we just, not my business. We just say nothing. We say, not my problem. We need to stand and defend the church as we would our own body, as we would our own bride. Now, fourthly, you are defending your enemies. You are defending your enemies. Setting apart Christianity from the rest of the world, we do not only defend our church family, we defend the very ones actively engaged in its destruction. We defend our enemies. To illustrate this point, we're going to now consider the two case studies, the two men in the early church uh, who adorned themselves with the armor of God, Stephen and Paul. If we think the armor is for us, is for defending ourselves, well, perhaps we've not been paying enough attention to the scriptures. And so as we look at a brief picture of these two men in the book of Acts, I want you to imagine 
each man adorned with armor. From the belt of truth to the helmet of salvation. And I want you to consider these questions. How does the armor serve those who wear it? How does the armor defend? How does it protect? How does it equip the men who wear it? We're first introduced to Stephen in Acts chapter 6. If you, if you still have your finger in Ephesians, you can turn over to Acts 7. We'll be there momentarily. And when we're introduced to Stephen, we see that Hellenistic Jew, Jewish widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. And so seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, were chosen to correct this sinful oversight. Stephen was one of those seven men. And is described in Acts 6.8, as full of grace and power, performing great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, but they were, quote, unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit which Stephen was speaking. So they resorted to lies, bringing forth false witnesses who accused Stephen of speaking against the law and against the temple. In Acts 7, Stephen adorns the armor. He makes a defense. He highlights the the truth of Jewish rebellion, the righteousness that God has accomplished, and the good news of salvation for those who put their hope in Jesus. He gives an awesome history lesson of God's faithfulness in spite of Israel's faithlessness. Stephen tells them the law of Moses pointed ahead to Jesus. Stephen proclaims to them that God is not limited to a temple that is made by human hands, and he wraps up what became his own eulogy with these words. In Acts 7, 51 to 53. You men are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart, and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You have received the laws ordained by angels, and yet did not keep it. Stephen defended the hope he had, a hope rooted in the victory of Jesus he had come to participate in through the church. We see in Stephen's defense a defense of his hope of the victory and of the church. And in his dying words, we see that he makes a defense for his enemies. Acts 7.60 Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Stephen was stoned to death while wearing the armor of God. He was crushed, but the gospel was not. For a young man was watching in hearty agreement with Stephen's execution. The very man who would go on to write a letter to the church at Ephesus about putting on the armor of God. I wonder if Paul, when he was writing this letter, thought about Stephen. Paul's story begins with the end of Stephen's life. A persecutor of the church, the artist formerly known as Saul, made many enemies of Christians, and yet on the road to Damascus, Jesus Jesus appeared to him as one untimely born. As we know, Paul would go on to become the apostle to the Gentiles, and as Gentiles ourselves, we can look to him as a spiritual forefather. And so returning to Ephesians for a moment, we're going back and forth, you should have your fingers in there. Uh, Returning to Ephesians for a moment, Look at what Paul writes immediately after his comments on the armor of God. Verses, I'll start with verse 19. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, not, excuse me, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Boldness refers to having the freedom to speak with no restraints, with no chains. And here we see the the beautiful irony of Paul's prayer request. Not that he be freed from his chains, but that his words, that the mystery of the gospel would be proclaimed freely. That the gospel would be without chains. Jesus himself promised that in such situations, uh, words would be provided. Luke 12, 11 through 12, when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that hour what you ought to say. Paul knew Jesus' promise 
even though he knew the promise, he still asked for boldness, that he would have the words to say uh, when, he, when he had to speak. Do you ever wonder why you should pray if God already knows everything? Do you ever wonder if your prayers make a difference? Our enemy is Satan, and these questions have his fingerprints all over them. They seem to appeal to, to attributes of God. God is omniscient. God is all-powerful. How could our prayers mean anything before such a powerful God? They sound real, sound true, but these questions fail to take into account God's love, God's compassion, His grace, and His desire to be known by you. These questions are lies. God is all-powerful and all-knowing, and yet He desires to hear and respond to our prayers. God has allowed Himself to be impacted by us. At times, God celebrates and rejoices over us. At times, he is grieved and weeps over us. Our prayers in, in Christ impact what God does. Does that mean we control God? Absolutely not. What it means is that God is a person, and he wants to be with us. He wants us to put on Christ, to put on this armor. And so keeping Paul's prayer request in mind, this prayer request to speak boldly, we return a final time to the book of Acts. Though chained, Paul's prayer is that the gospel would be proclaimed boldly, unchained, unhindered. Now, if you've ever read the book of Acts, you've noticed it kind of ends abruptly. Uh, it's, it's almost disappointing in the sense that you have Paul in chains being sent from, from king to council to king to council, and it all seems to be setting up for this big interaction between Paul and Caesar. And so you're like, yeah, I want to see how that goes. And then you get to the end of the book, and the face-off never comes. Suddenly, it just ends. And, and, and we, the reader, are just like, you know, how'd that go? Well, I mean, I, I hear that in, in church tradition, Paul got decapitated, so I kind of know how it goes, but, but I, wanted to, I want to see it. And so we, we hear all of that, but keeping in mind Paul's prayer request in Ephesians, I want you to hear how the book of Acts ends. Acts 28, 30 to 31. And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters, this is a prison, and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. And so we see at the conclusion of Acts, Paul's prayer has been answered. Though he was chained, the gospel was being proclaimed unhindered. The focus of the book of Acts is not this big uh, face-off between Paul and Caesar. It's about the advance of the gospel unhindered, unchained. And so the question that we return to is, if, how then does the, the armor serve those who wear it? How does the armor defend, protect, and equip the men who wear it? Well, to conclude... When we think about armor, we are probably inclined to think about protection and preservation, to borrow a few Ps from last week. But in Stephen and Paul, we see the armor equips believers to boldness, because the armor is not meant to protect the one bearing it, but to protect the message, to protect the good news, that Jesus is Lord and King. And though we are sinners, Christ died for us, that by his wounds we are healed. The armor of God paints a beautiful picture of Jesus who is the truth, who is our righteousness, whose good news brings peace, who is our shield and salvation. Jesus is our hope. Jesus conquered sin and death by laying down his life for his bride and praying forgiveness for his enemies. Stephen and Paul followed in his footsteps. And as we go forth from here, the question is not, will you die for your faith? That's out of our hands. The question is, will you be bold for Jesus and his good news with your life? Will you do that? Will you live boldly for him? Because that is why he has given us his armor. With that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you praise for all that you have done. Oh Lord, we thank you that you have equipped us to, to de defend one another, that you have equipped us to to go on. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for all that you have done for us. It's in your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button.
And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.